Welcome to the Loud Noise Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Walsh. Loud Noise is where I dig into conversations with some of my favorite musicians. Our goal is to share experiences and ideas that you can use in your own creative development. From breakthroughs and challenges to successes and lessons learned, you'll have a front row seat to the best show in town. I'm a guitar player, writer, producer, living in Prague, Czech Republic, via Nashville, via New York City. I've spent my life living the dream and making music. I've had a lot of help along the way, and this is a chance for me to share some of what I've learned with you. So let's crank it up and join me in welcoming today's guest for some loud noise. This week on Loud Noise, I'm excited to share my conversation with a good friend of mine, Victor Krauss. Victor's a bass player from Champaign, Illinois, who lives in Nashville, Tennessee. He's been Lyle Lovett's primary bass player since 1994, and I can still remember the first time I heard him play, which was on the classic Bill Frizzell album, Gone Just Like a Train. His discography is deep. He's played with so many iconic artists in so many different genres, it's mind-boggling. Tom Jones, Sean Colvin, Sheryl Crow, Robert Plant, James Taylor, and Elvis Costello are just a few of the artists that have called on Victor for his unique bass style. In our conversation, we talk about how Victor conceives of his bass sound, both on acoustic bass and electric bass, his thoughts about time and groove and feel, and what it's like to play with some of the greatest drummers in the world. We also get into Victor's solo records, Far From Enough and Two, both of which had a big influence on me. In 2007, I began playing guitar in Victor's band, which still feels like a dream to me, Along with guitarist Todd Lombardo and drummer Robert Crawford, we dug deep into the music and we gained so much from the experience, including a chance encounter with the one and only Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin while we were rehearsing Plant's song, Big Log, with Victor's sister, Alison Krauss. If you liked today's interview and would like to reach out to Victor, you can find him at www.victorkraus.com or on Instagram at KrausVictor. That's K-R-A-U-S-S-V-I-K-T-O-R. If you enjoy the Loud Noise podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from, and please subscribe to the show. It helps get the word out about Loud Noise, and I hope to bring these conversations to as many people as possible. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Victor Krauss. Before you started playing double bass, you were already playing guitar and electric bass or no? No, I, I first started on piano. I started piano when I was five. And then I, uh, like in, f- I think it was fifth grade, I started playing a little bit of trumpet. And then, uh, and then, and I think, I think it was either before I started middle school or, or maybe my first year of middle school, I saw somebody playing it in the, in the orchestra and i just thought that looked so cool i was i was more attracted to the way it looked and and you could just it did did something like you could just tell when somebody was playing it there was something different happening uh and so then i was like okay i i i want to try this and and uh and just fell in love with it immediately so it was i I think it was i must have been um 12 and um and then I started playing, uh, you know, my sister was already doing a lot, a lot of the fiddle contests. That was a, a nice way for me to kind of jump into that. And, and since a lot of that music didn't necessarily have sheet music that you could pick up, you had to do a lot of stuff by ear. So there was, there was a lot of teaching on my own at the same time of doing like traditional orchestral stuff. Did you have a good junior high and high school music program? Oh, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, we had a teacher named Carlisle Johnson in the uh, in the band department, and then we had uh, uh, Leo Pondelec, who was uh, who was the strings teacher, who my sister had also had, and um, and everybody thought he was ter- you know really scary, and he was just very determined for kids to do a great job, and you know, and when you met him off campus, he was like you know the sweetest guy you ever met. It was a, a teacher who came in after him named. Ben Fulser, who was uh, was also a string bass uh, player, um, I, you know, I just I just really just loved the instrument, and I, I took uh, a couple I took for a couple of years of private te- uh, private lessons, mainly from jazz players, and um, uh, and they they really kind of introduced me to what was 
really possible on the uh huh. In ter- when you say that in terms of more technically or more in terms of like how harmony worked and things like that, or were you getting that? It's kind great. of a little bit of both. Uh, you know, technically and where they would actually, uh, I had this great, um, t- the one that really st- stuck stuck out for me was a, was a woman named Karen Korsmeyer, who, um, and this was, I think this was in middle school. I definitely in, in part of high school too. Yeah, it was definitely pre-high school. Uh, where she gave gave me this tape, which I still have, um, this cassette of all these kind of famous bass players like um, uh, Ray Brown and Oscar Pettiford and Paul Chambers, Charles Mangus, and um, just kind of like it was almost like one or two selections by each one of these players, and um, so I'd have to learn, I'd have to learn the heads of all these, and she would write out the 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 heads and I so I would learn them, um, and then kind of figure out how to navigate either through uh, playing through the changes or solos and all that all that kind of stuff and, and that was that was really valuable training for me, but then also uh, you know at the same time of playing the upright bass I then started taking um, I started playing electric bass too, and. Uh, which I loved, and uh, and I and I didn't really listen to a whole lot of rock music until my freshman year, and it was the the uh, Yes nine oh two uh, what was it nine oh one two five yeah it's definitely not nine oh two one zero it's the other one <laughs> not not the, not Beverly Hills nine oh two one zero yeah exactly yeah uh, <laughs> that record and uh, you know and then that kind of like especially like leave it. You know, that tune off there, you know, I started, you know, like I, I really want, you know, like I, I learned every little nuance, even though it's the same bass line throughout the whole thing. I, I paid attention enough to, to really wanted to know all the little variations of that. And then, and then in uh, high school, uh, somebody introduced me to Led Zeppelin and then I was uh, warped for life. Yeah, there's no, there's no coming back. There's no coming that. back. I, I've never been able to kick it. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing when I listen to you play that one of the one of the most unique things to me is about how you think about putting your sound together and also your intonation which is amazing if if not perfect and then but beyond that is how you organize your vocabulary because I you've got such a interesting confluence of influences and then experiences with learning because you know just knowing you I know your passion for rock music and kind of 80s rock music, ACDC, Led Zeppelin. You love classical music. You love film score. Um, you have some jazz training, but I think in all the time we've known each other, we've very seldomly ever even spoken about jazz music. And then growing up accompanying, you know, if you're accompanying your sister doing fiddle tunes and stuff, that, you know, that music has a whole other vocabulary. And somehow you've organized this in a way that you've developed your own vocabulary out of all of that. Was that conscious or have you thought about it? Oh, gosh. Um, I You know, maybe some. Um I mean, I I almost kind of then just after a while, you know, I I think it really. I mean, yeah, I was always interested in a lot lots of things, and I was always writing songs, or or tunes. I you know, I never think of myself as a lyricist or a, a singer, so it was always kind of more on the instrumental side of things. Um, you know, it's funny. I I always I um, kind of being in a in a in the bass chair. For all all the things, it was always kind of a cool way to just be in the band, uh, because I mean everybody needs that. Um, it all you know ninety five percent of the music out there you know, be, you know I think benefits from having bass and not even if it if it necessarily calls for it every time, but I mean I, I guess from a sonic point of view, um, especially on the upright bass, I always um, wanted to figure out a way. To be able to do some of the stuff that the you know the presence of an electric bass, but to be able to have it with, with the big one, uh, with the upright and and not necessarily miss it, and you know and I love the idea of being able to still have sustain and and be able to have power in notes, um, 
you know, not only just from a sonic point, but you know, from from um, no no choices you make, uh, even electronics. You know, just having enough certain things that are are kind of helping each other. You know, like like even from having you know, first of all, having the bass set up really, really well. So, I mean, it's it's a it's a losing battle anyway, that instrument, without having any frets. So, like, to have as many things that are kind of working in your favor, <laughs> um, um, so you don't have to think about as much, okay, playing in tune, or if, if each one of the um, notes are even, or if there are any dead spots on your instrument. So having it set up wonderfully, and I've been fortunate to work with a, uh, a luthier here in town for you know i guess 26 years who gets it set up as 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 well as it can be so like you're never working a, you know the instrument is doing you favors as opposed to you kind of being at battle with the instrument and then um you know electronically i i you know i ha i use uh three different pickups and uh um, and I change the strings like you know every three or four months, um, so it's everything is kind of healthy <laughs> sounding. And then with you know uh, with using a microphone and using pickups, there are certain things that you can't assume if you put a microphone in the in front of the bass that it's going to cover everything that it possibly can do. Uh, even if you have twelve microphones on there, it's not going to pick up. Um, what it sounds like inside of the bridge or, you know, if, if you're attracted to that sound. So there's going to be su some sustain that you can't do with just a microphone. And I even found out within the last 10 years that using a magnetic pickup off the, off the fingerboard does an amazing thing. And I, I'm trying to figure out, I, I don't think we were, you know, when we were playing together, I was even doing that. Um, so now... Um, uh, you know, I, I use this uh, pickup on the end that I can get really, really loud, and so it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's essentially turning your upright into a precision bass, and uh, so you know, a mix of all these things kind of conquers uh, some survival techniques with feedback, and just kind of covers some area that's sometimes not possible just to do with a mic or or um, or even with a piezo pickup. Do you think that some of that, because I notice um, when I watch you play, and also because I've heard you play Unplugged, too, up close, probably some of that started developing even early on in terms of, like, your physiology when you play kind of your right-hand position. Like, I feel like the sound starts with you. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, like, yeah, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> like, the right hand... Um, you know, I, I think there, there's some physics that you can kind of, um, I, maybe that was kind of early on, you know, because uh, I used to spend, I mean, I mean, I, I just ended up loving the instrument so much that I would, you know, like, I would, like, I remember my Sundays in high school, or even in parts of middle school, where I would look to, you know, where Sunday was kind of a, a boring day or, or without a whole lot going on, I would, I would pretty much have the bass in my hand almost the entire day. Um, you know, and just kind of just messing around with it. I, I even remember watching TV playing it and seeing the note like a, this was this was kind of I don't know if you can do that now with with TVs that are now made. But I remember when there was a tube television, if you if you watched um, the string with the television in the background, you would actually see the waveform. um going against a, a a 60 cycle visual this is probably impossible to explain from a <laughs> <laughs> but it was to, so to, cool to anybody under 35 yeah <laughs> anyone under 35 but you, yeah you would actually see the waveform almost like an oscilloscope and and so then you would see like you know just how the pitch would change or the waveform would change just by how pitch would go and it was like the coolest discovery um, and I remember kind of doing little things that, oh, okay, if I, if I alter this, what does it do for that visual? It also does it for the sound. And so, I, you know, I think also after playing electric bass and electric guitar, I started to figure out on, on the bass, okay, well, if I, if my right hand is closer to the bridge or if it goes up closer to, to, you know, up the neck, 
what is that going to do to the sonic um, qualities of how I play? And and I remember doing this, you know, it's so like even if if I have a have a someone that I'm doing in person or one I've ever I've taught in the past, I said, okay, well, think of it like an a, like a Les Paul configuration uh, pickups. So if like if you're going to be closer to the bridge, it's almost like you're in lead position. If you go up closer to the neck, it's going to be more like a rhythm position. And um, so if I'm wanting something rounder. You know, I might kind of come up closer to the up the fingerboard and want something a little more pointed. Um, go toward the bridge, and I kind of found that there's one area, like on the base, the main base that I record on, that it's like almost right at the edge of the fingerboard. Kind of gives me this uh, kind of a combination of of both, where you know it, it gets a little rounder and and. And it's, and it's the same way with positioning a microphone in the studio. Whenever I get uh, an engineer, a lot of the time they'll say, well, where do you like it? And, um, and you know, and I'll usually tell them it's kind of right in this area that's slightly above the bridge. And, um, and uh, um, but you don't want it too high because then you start getting finger noise. And if you go too low, then it's almost like you get a little bit of a, of a, a nasty... Um, tubbiness exactly and, and you see you said something really 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 important i think that you're not losing any face by asking the person you're recording where did they normally how do they normally treat their instrument because most musicians especially in nashville is amazing because musicians are so so cool and easy to work with that they just roll with almost anything but i think a lot of engineers can learn so much from asking the person they're recording especially when their instruments they may not record a lot how do you like to record your instrument? It's such a simple question that can get you much better results. Oh yeah, I the, the the best ones that I work with always ask, and the ones that don't ask and um, uh, in, invariably <laughs> end up asking later, or uh, you know, or, or they or have an ego thinking, well, they know what it is, because the last instrument they did did this. Um, it usually ends up the ones that are like at the top of their game always ask. Exactly. And bass is such a peculiar instrument, whether it be electric or acoustic, is because the low mid-range information is so dense and there's so much happening sonically that if you can get it closer when you record it, as opposed to doing a lot of EQ on it, you're going to be so much further ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and I think also it's just, uh, like, I, 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 I mean, as you know, you know, like, with especially upright bass, it's like uh, mid range and high end information is is like your ultimate friend in that you know like uh, like upper mids to me are like like that's the kind of like the key to making it not take over um, a track and you know you can always yeah because that stuff is harder to recreate versus like bringing in low end. You know, you can bring in low end forever, but you can't get the you can't make artificial high sure. end. Sure. Well, well, if it if it's not there, you can't invent it. Yeah. You know, you can't bring it out if it doesn't even exist. I know this just from sitting in front of your waveforms in front of a computer, um, and I think that this is one of the hardest things to do, particularly on a double bass. Is and I don't know how you do it, and I've only seen a few people who can do it. Is you have ability to control your dynamic where every note is speaking at the same level where a lot of times with with the double bass as an instrument invariably depending on the key the instrument the way it was recorded some notes are louder than others and some notes disappear and that creates an incredible amount of work to try to troubleshoot for an engineer for a mixer yeah uh, like i've i've run into that i mean like um well i mean i think it's i got really lucky with one of the instruments that i have like the main recording one uh, that one is super even that's the um the 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 usec or is that uh, it's it, with the check instrument that's the the jusec bass and I, i've used that one since uh, ooh, uh 95 or 94 um you know what one thing i do like to do for engineers too um when when I'm just when they're getting a sound on me, I, I'll just play, kind of a chromatic scale, kind of slowly, um, 
and um, yeah, as opposed to just kind of noodling, a lot of the time I'll just start playing kind of low, you know, kind of a slower paced chromatic thing. So if anything does jump out in either the the speaker um, or or how uh, you know in the speakers or in the control room or in the room that I'm in, if anything does jump out, then that then maybe there's a a different position I can go, um, and um, um, and maybe there's a you know a curve on the EQ that they can discover right away or or decide oh okay well maybe this isn't the microphone to use. Um, but found that to be kind of helpful. But I I don't know I mean um, you know I I, I kind of think of it as almost like a horn player embouchure that that there's a um, you know that there's a kind of a consistent um, level that you do in your hand that okay well here I'm not gonna. Um, and and it's also set up too, you know. Like if you have one string that's, you know, dead, or one position on your uh, bridge that isn't, uh, I don't know. I, I it's funny. I've got a kind of a running joke with my lute, the, the luthier that I go see, uh, Jim Ferguson, who's amazing. Like if the wind changes direction and I think the bridge got bumped, I'm pretty much going to take it to him. I mean, you can kind of tell when something is off, you know, and it can be even just the weather changes with the with the top shrinking at certain ter- ter- certain times of the year and suddenly your the g or d string is too low so you kind of go okay well i need to fix that and how much um how much carryover is there between how you deal with the um with the acoustic bass and the electric bass i mean i i kind of think of them as you know just in terms of like if you think of like playing cells or like certain positions on the on the big bass versus the 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 electric it's kind of the same thing, uh, you know, and um, I love open strings on the big bass, you know, whereas necessarily electric, you can sometimes where you may want a position to play a fretted A versus an open A. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a, a, I mean, I think they're the kind of, kind of the same thing. I mean, there's a, there's a certain set, set of approaches that I do on the, on the, on, um, on the upright versus the, the electric, especially, you know, I mean, um, because of the, you know, lack of frets or one thing. Um, and I hope you don't mind. I've given a, given away one of your secrets: the fact that you will often retune the double bass based on the key of the song you're playing or record. It's harder to do on a gig, of course, but in the studio, yeah, yeah, it's common for you. <laughs> that way, you do have choice open strings. If it's possible. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I I love that. You know, like because I just like um, just to how the character, of the instrument, like especially if you can get open strings, like uh, um, uh, you know, I always think of like E flat is about the worst key for for us guitarists and and <laughs> bass players a lot of the time because then we we totally lose the ability to go low and. Um, uh, you know, or, or to get even, be- I mean, you're all, you're kind of sharing the same range as a, as a guitarist and, um, and, you know, and oftentimes, you know, a guitarist will tune down and I was thinking, well, why not? I could do that too. And, uh, <laughs> um, or, you know, like, or if it's B major to have, um, or, or even A flat, uh, major to be able to get lower than every, everyone else. Or um, I, I don't like to necessarily tune the bass up uh, more than a whole step because then you're you're kind of you you kind of kill your strings right away. Um, but I mean, like an open F F sharp um, on the E string is a fantastic sound. You know, it's just, it just gets so much tighter sounding. Or uh, or an open F uh, on the E string, or uh, an open B flat, or uh, um, uh, I like. To me, like the uh, uh, the bass tuned up a half step is like incredible sounding, just because it's there's suddenly there's this tightness and power that's just uh, different sounding. And then also, I mean, I don't know, it's just like uh, to get harmonics that like an A flat harmonic or an uh, an E flat harmonic on a G string is impossible to do live, but you know. You've got the luxury to to kind of do something that's totally interesting or unique in the studio because you have the luxury to do it and just you know let uh, let somebody else figure out how you did 
<laughs> did it <laughs> after the fact. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to loop back for a second because I, I, there's something I wanted to ask that I forgot. In in the early days, did you and Allison spend a lot of time playing music together? And one of the other things, I wonder if there's some correlation in there is because both of you, because your intonation on the bass and just her intonation with everything, is there... Is there some correlation with that? Is it maybe with the with the teachers you had going to school or just playing together or genetics? I don't know. <laughs> I you know I don't know either. You know I mean I I think, um, I, you know I, I it always sounds I hate this term but I I realized that I had perfect pitch when I was um, uh, I think it was eleven or twelve, and um, I was uh, I used to sing in the uh, uh, the opera choruses going. Uh, yeah, you know, like they, the University of Illinois had these great productions they did, and um, and uh, you know, and, and uh, the the kids would would you know it, like we do um, the our opera Carmen and La Boheme, and uh, so we would all sing in those. Uh, and I was started to be able to to figure out. I I think that probably had something to do with it being able to know where the pitches sounded like i mean i also sat at the piano a lot of the time and just really liked messing with intervals um yeah i don't, I don't know I, I don't know it might have been genetics <laughs> does I, allison also have perfect pitch she will not claim to have it she says she has days that are better than others in terms of being able to identify notes uh, you know like sometimes mine will drift uh, a little bit and i'll get confused or if something is not completely in like you know if if something was had a very speed recording i can be totally thrown off and have no idea what it is yeah and i and i think for anyone who's maybe this idea is new to somebody i think it, it's more important to have really strong relative pitch than to be worried about the fact you don't have perfect pitch yeah yeah um i mean it, it comes really handy in terms of writing charts well that that's another question i, I guess because in nashville there's a thing called the nashville number system which is relied upon in the studio every day but often I see you actually writing the chords or at least the roots or whatever over the numbers in your charts. Is there some connection to the to the perfect pitch thing with that? Does it help you or is it just that the numbers make you nuts? The, well, you know, it's funny. I uh, For me, the numbers kind of, it's there's an extra conversion um, process that, yes, that I, I think, I think if I didn't, uh, you know, I don't. I I don't get the luxury of playing with a capo, so I always have to know what the real note is. Um, the number system comes in really handy when you know when we're talking about the different uh, tunings um, to know to suddenly okay, um, if I'm going to play uh, out of D and I want it to sound like E flat, I'm going to write it as in D. So that's where the numbers kind of come in handy. Um, <coughs> Uh, but a lot of the time I'll, I'll just hear the, the, the numbers. Um, yeah, there's sometimes slows me down in terms of my accuracy. <laughs> like I'll be, I'm, I'll be much more likely to make a mistake if I just see numbers and I don't know. And, and, and I, I also think that, um, if I, if I think a certain key versus the intervals that they involve, um, I think I approach it differently. Like if I play out of G, I think of this as opposed to thinking, oh, okay, these are ones and this is the next thing is a four and a five or a six or something like that. That if, if, if I know, okay, this is the tonality of G, I'm going to think of the tonality of G versus to the shape of what those... Does that make sense? That makes total sense because each key... I mean, each key has its own qualities that are kind of intrinsic to themselves. Yeah. And then you can kind of draw on that much more readily if you are thinking about, oh, well, the key of B, especially in rock music, has an E have their own things as opposed to G or as opposed to getting into a flat key or whatever. Oh, yeah, definitely. There's a whole set of, I think there's a whole set of things per key, you know, I mean... um, you know, I mean, and it's not just uh, the navigation, but it's just, it's. I think it's an attitude, too, a little bit. I wanted to move over because the other thing, like, you know, we, we just spent some time talking about the sound aspect of, of your playing and your thinking. But the other thing, which is 
the other side of the coin, the yin ti or yang, so to speak, is um, your sense of time and then how your sense of feel impacts your sense of time. At what point did you start to think about it or have you ever put any serious thought into thinking about time and groove and feel and the differences between those things or is it all the same thing to you? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, since it was a lot of times where I was playing without a drummer, you know, especially like playing either stuff with my sister or, or um, you know, or, or you know, singer-songwriters that don't bring a, a, a drummer along, um, where, um, where you kind of have to be everything. You know, where it's, it's, uh, you're, um, uh, it's not just kind of playing the right notes and supporting the guitarist. It's kind of being like durations of notes. Um, you know, that the cutoffs are just as important as the attack, you know? Um, and, and I also kind of think of, uh, and I, I remember doing this with teaching, like the duration of, of notes, you can almost kind of have it all relate to a drummer. Um, like if your notes are short, you can kind of think of it in the same way as if a, uh, um, a drummer is playing a hi-hat versus longer notes playing a ride cymbal. So like if the chorus comes around and you want to change stuff around um, so it's not exactly the same thing per section, that you might change your durations a little bit or you might change um, little pickup notes or... Um, uh, or setting up phrases like how a drummer would um, set up a phrase uh, with a fill, and um, and it's it's funny. I mean, like after a while, you know, if you learn all these things, kind of how you know how forms are setting up uh, of uh, different sections, uh, you know, like with drummers that you've never played with before, suddenly you're playing the exact same fills over each other, and um, and it's pretty exciting when they work. <laughs> and so it's, it's always exciting when you, when you kind of work with somebody that has had that same set of thoughts in mind um, to then, then you're doing it together. You know, it's funny, in the 80s, I remember getting, there was this very funny, um, I'd always write these goofy songs with my friend. It was just funny stuff like Frank Zappa material. Uh, and um, I, there was a record that uh, this friend of mine brought over. It was it was actually um, a long playing record and a cassette that was this thing called Ultra Drums. And, um, and, I, and I wish somebody, maybe somebody's already done this, but if they haven't already done this, then somebody needs to do it again, where they had taken, it was like total like Simmons electronic drums, um, and it's so dated sounding. It was like 1983 or four when it was made. And it was these preconceived or pre um, song forms that they made. And it was like these three minute long songs of just the drum track. It was like they were playing to something where they took the, all the drums, the, the other music away. And, um, and uh, so you just kind of play along and create stuff. Uh, to these drums, drum tracks. And I remember, and then, and then shortly after that, I bought a drum machine, a Boss uh, Dr. Rhythm um, machine, that my sense of time, after just playing along with something that was metronomic, but so much more fun to play along with than a metronome, got so much better. And um, like just because I was doing that all the time, and, th and that became kind of my template to, to kind of play along with that became a little bit more me and um and it, 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 it i don't know it just became part of more of my dna i think just being like being used to playing something that was you know maybe not the most human thing but metronomic and essentially um you know what your what your uh, teachers wanted you to do play along with metronome but i was playing along with something a little more fun do you tend to think of um and it may sh it may change depending you know based on what's happening but 
Do you think of time kind of more in the center of the beat, or do you think about being a little on ahead of the beat or on the back of the beat, or is it always kind of moving? Because you have you have a relatively big, solid beat. Uh, um, well, I, I think it depends. Um, I mean, like, uh, I mean, it totally depends on who you're playing with a lot of the time, and then uh, you know, stylistically, and and the individual drummer or the other players. Like, I, I feel like you can't always be the tyrant of time, you know, you have to kind of, um, uh, you kind of have to give and take to who you're playing with. I mean, you can be an authority, but you can't be like, oh, this is it, and I'm always right, you know. You, you, I mean, but you can't let it fall apart, too. I, I heard someone say once that, um, and I, and I think this is true, is you can't have a good band without a great drummer, but you can have an amazing band without a great great bass player that's the thing that takes it because it's so um in the ether what that is but it's yeah. really obvious when there's a great drummer yeah i i, I think so too you know and it's always it, it is funny i mean like um it's uh <laughs> this may be too much of a tangent you know i always look at band photos we used to joke about the bass player in the band you could always pick out the bass player because he was Always the one, the least guy you'd want to talk to, or the one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> you go, or like, or like, oh well, he seems kind of uninteresting, you know, or or doesn't look like he's having a good time. And it's usually, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's the one that's, you know, it's it's the one that's kind of, oh, or or he's the guitar player that wishes he was, or you know, or he got stuck on bass because there wasn't too, there was too many. Uh, guitarists around but it's it i think it is a certain type of personality that uh wants to be in that position a lot of the time is the as uh, you know the servant to the music i would i would agree with you um i thought maybe we could pick um a few uh drummers and that you've worked with and if there's anything anything you got from them in terms of like revelations from working with different some of the different drummers you've worked with you know, and, and again, it, it's kind of the revelation is, is uh, you know, with playing with anybody good or, uh, you know, any kind of personality, it, it's kind of what do they make you do as a musician? You know, like it's uh, how can I relax or do what what am I able to do because of this person being here? And uh, someone like uh, Russ Kunkel, who I get to play with Lyle, love it all the time. You know, I remember playing with him for the first couple times you know in the studio and um going wow you know boy that's that classic sound that that you totally expect from him and and a lot of the time and this was when i was younger i was thinking okay well you know it's just a lot of that is just his nuance but it's also how he's mic'd and and all that and i remember the first time playing with him live i was going oh it's not how he's mic'd it's because of how he plays it and you know, just realizing that, you know, he's got, uh, he's so aware of how to make the, the, the drums sound on a sonic level that, um, there's a reason why those toms sound the way he, they do. And, uh, it, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of like the same way we were talking about how you make every note sound a certain way or even, and, you know, he's, figured out a way of all the years he's been playing how to make make his whole kit sound a certain way you know like how, how his touch has made it sound you know like exactly what you want it <laughs> to to do um you know and just you know that the the level of taste and kind of serving the song and you just kind of jump in and it's just like oh wow okay you all you have to do is coast and uh you know that that's a that's a wonderful example. I mean, like someone like Steve Jordan, who played on my first album, you know, and uh, and I've played I've played with him a, a few other times too. It's it's kind of, um, it, it's a it's a command. When you think of Steve Jordan, you think of, oh well, that's Steve Jordan. You know, it's 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 a personality, and. Um, um, you play a certain way. I mean, it's the command and and uh, ferociousness, you know. And in, in the in the same way of um, um, Matt Chamberlain, um, who 
it does exactly what you're kind of hoping he will do. Um, you know, uh, I always kind of call him like there's a middle finger to his playing and, uh, uh <laughs> that it's just like, I'm here to, you know, to, uh, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the, boy, how do I explain that? Um, there's, a, it's, it's a sound of how he attacks it too. Um, it's like all these guys with embouchure and, um, um, character and tone and, uh, creativity, you know, someone like Jim Keltner, who's, I, I remember the first time rehearsing with him and going, you yeah, know, this is, this is pretty great. And, uh, I remember the, then being in the, uh, the studio for the first time and, and my jaw dropped, you know, with just him, his awareness of, of, um, how he's going to attack each individual drum and the the looseness of it but still the 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 feel of total command like it, it could almost feel like oh any given moment this could maybe fall apart with intention uh, if that makes sense but it never does you know it's like like on the like my first real experience was him with was on the Bill Frizzell uh, gone just like a train record where I felt lucky like between Bill and Jim, that was one of those, uh, you know, where they're free to go off on any um, tangent um, and self-expression. I felt like, okay, my role here is to be kind of the uh, the trunk, you know, the tree trunk, to kind of keep it all together so then they can do what... Uh, uh, what they, you know, to kind of fly in every direction. And that totally felt like the right role. And, you know, and, and, uh, did that come like, for instance, in that particular s situation with, um, Jim Keltner, did that come to you pretty immediately? Like, was that a conscious decision or was that just, you just kind of fell into that role naturally? I think it kind of fell into that. And, and, and then, and then as we were recording, I was just like, oh, you know, this is kind of, I think I maybe realized it more so as it was happening to to kind of be that rock. So it, uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, and then there there are other people that that uh, I mean, like someone like Kenny Wallace, and where you can just kind of float, and it's just like, oh wow, you know, like Bill had a great way of saying when when we were doing stuff, of saying that it was like a like a Cadillac running very smoothly, you know. And then someone like Rob Crawford, who we got to play with, and who I still play with, you know, he's kind of that same school, like just. I'm going to play what needs to be happening here. And, you know, and the, those kind of players you you love. Yeah, it's effortless. effortless. I think we all know one of your biggest inspirations is ACDC. And oh, yes. let's admit, Masters of Patience. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much to learn from those guys about how to play music. Yeah, I mean, I, I got so into them for a period of time. You know, it's like even when we were talking about drummers and downbeats, like for Malcolm Young, you know, I, I thought of, Gosh, I mean, like it just opened my eyes, you know, like how one unit can be, um, you know, that each one of their parts may not be the most exciting, but the sum of the parts is something absolutely amazing, you know, and, and, you know, like it, it, it helped me kind of realize the importance of, you know, durations and how to approach a downbeat, you know, like, uh, the separation of notes and Cliff Williams bass parts or, or, uh, uh, you know, for Malcolm Young, like even how to, like I was talking about downbeats, like it's like, down, da, 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 you know, or it's, uh, down, da, you know, <laughs> uh, um, you know, all that stuff, uh, or Phil Rudd, you know, not even taking a fill, um, uh, for, you know, half the song, you know, uh, totally. uh, bass in the verse. yeah, yeah, uh, Secret arranging trick. Oh gosh, you know, you know, and that's another thing too. You know, we were talking about you know like how to shape parts and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, ACDC and and um, you know, like how important it is maybe not to play, or when is your magic first entrance and what does that do? You know, uh, or if it goes away for a verse again, you know, uh, all that stuff is just so important. And in terms or or octaves, I mean, I, I've talked about, um, I were talking about octaves a bunch 
Um, that, that actually goes back to another point about like keeping the notes consistent, like especially on bass, you can do, um, um, you can simulate dynamics through the uh, octave changes. And, and th this came to me playing a show, like, you know, like playing in, in the middle of octave or like if you're staying in kind of first position and staying in one octave and then going down to the lowest octave, like if you're staying on a higher E or even the upper octave, like it, it suddenly becomes smaller as you go higher. And then when you go to your lowest possible note, um, what that does to you physically, you know, like it's, it's almost the same, like, uh, um, a low E versus the middle E says something totally different, you know, and then it's the same. It's a, it's just, a, it's an easy trick to go between, um, you know, when you're sculpting a part for a recording, like how long can you wait to introduce that first lowest, really lowest note? And, you know, and it's just, a. It's like you getting your queen out for the first time in chess. Totally, because once you once you reveal it, you can't go back. Yeah, you can't go back. You won't have that same impact, and you know, unless you stay, unless you jump out, you know, for sixteen bars and then come back in with that. You look at your discography. You've worked with so many, recorded and performed with so many different um, artists we all know, which is amazing. But I wanted to kind of touch on a couple in particular, and anyone you may want to um highlight but um i think two of your um long running and maybe i'm guessing influential um collaborations have been your work with bill frizzell and also with lyle lovett um what um what was your experience working with bill frizzell and um what did that what did that give your musicality what did that give you as a musician and as a as a composer and the first time i recorded with him was in 95 and that was for the nashville album i i remember there was a couple people he had been kind of in the discussions with kyle lenning about assembling a band for this and and my name kind of came up i think both with kyle and a couple other people saying that i might be a an interesting addition to the record. And I think it was because cause I had played a bunch of bluegrass and country music before that and but was also, you know, also known a little bit as a jazz musician too. I mean a little bit. Uh and I remember talking to him on the phone and I was like, boy, he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> but I hadn't ever heard of anything and then and I was telling, him, oh yeah, I may play on some Bill Frizzell project and and uh the jazz guys that I knew, oh, Bill Frizzell, you know, and you know. Oh, so you were completely unaware of Bill before this. Oh, that's funny. And so, you know, I said, okay, well, this will be neat. And, and I remember going, we re recorded over at Sound Emporium. And I remember that the first day playing something, and it was, it was a tune that didn't make the album. And uh, it was really cool, though. And I remember going, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is incredible. And I remember the other, and it was like a couple of days after I'd gotten out of, off of uh, of a tour with Lyle, and so I was in really good shape. And this was also a band without without a drummer. I found with him, he was so freeing that it was almost like it was impossible to me to feel like you could make a mistake. But it was like one of these things where you just kind of felt like, oh well, I feel like I know what I'm to do here, you know. And it was just it was just a kind of a magical time and i and i kind of stayed in touch with him and there was a couple of rounds of recordings with him and then i had uh you know kind of left some silly phone messages and that kind of stuff and we would talk every once in a while and then he would he called me and asked if i wanted to do the the trio record with um with jim keltner and so then we did that one and then there was uh the good dog happy man album which came out a little later and was there a lot of discussion about what to play or conceptually how we wanted the music to feel, or was it always left to be pretty open? He always would kind of write almost like a left-handed thing, you know, and so like a, like a, a lot of the stuff on, it was all handwritten, like lead sheets, but there would always be some kind of left-hand type of thing. And, um, and some of them were, were more open, like the, the version of Look Out for Hope, that was something that was 
we we kind of landed on and and I and that part that bass part ended up being kind of my own thing on that but but a lot of them were were actually almost completely realized but nothing too iron fisted Mm -hmm. So something like, say, for instance, like a song like Blues for Los Angeles would just be a simple lead sheet with that bass ostinato written out. Yeah, that was all written. And then that made total sense for me to just play that thing the entire way through. That's a perfect example of of having to be like, you know, I'm going to be the foundation and let you do everything, you know, everything you want to (laughs) do. Did you get any glimpses into what his creative process and how he puts music together? Gosh, that's a good question. Um... It was always so distinctly him. He would talk about who his influences were, but uh, um, and and I think I was there mainly a lot of the time because I wasn't necessarily thought of as the traditional jazz guy. So I I was kind of pooling from that side of him, you know, the kind of Americana or or uh, you know folky kind of or or even country type of music I, I think the most jazz album that i played on his was the sweetest punch album which was the uh burt backrack uh, elvis costello collaboration and uh that was amazing it was where i first worked with brian blade and he was on that that project but that was probably that was the most jazz side of of anything i got to do your relationship over the years with Lyle Lovett, you've been working with him for an incredibly long time. Yeah, yeah, uh, since uh, uh, late 90, 1994. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that is a long time. How has that evolved over time? I started with him based on kind of just wanting to do it. And I, I let a, a lot of people, I mean, I got that gig kind of, I remember hearing Lyle Lovett and his large band album, which came out in 88, I was in the U of I jazz bands, you know, the big band, which I absolutely love to do, you know, the, the big, you know, traditional jazz stuff. And, and so when I heard him, I was like, that's really cool. And I was kind of starting to think about, well, moving to Nashville. And I said, boy, if I could work with anybody, wouldn't he be great? You know, because he was such a kind of a, a class act and so well respected and quirky, you know, and I, I you know, I'd, I'd like to do that. So then... There were enough people that I kind of had ties to him, and um, I had uh, kind of found out who did that, and uh, you know who was his manager, and I kind of, I just let a lot of people know that I wanted to do it, and uh, you know, and, and this was Ken Levitan at the time, and and I remember calling him and saying, well, you know, I'd love to do this, and he says, well, um, Lyle, you know, doesn't really need anybody right now, but it will keep and keep you in mind and all that kind of stuff. And that's a really bold move in the sense that um, had you done some gigs on that level with, or was this, or was there a naivety? Uh, there was, what is the word? yeah, it was probably naive a little bit. I mean, I was working with I, my first gig that I, I mean, I had done, I had some doors open for my sister, you know, um, just saying, oh yeah, well he's. Capable, I guess, and uh, yeah, he, he's a talented uh, one. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I was—I I had done a tour with uh, Shelby Lynn prior to it, and then um, Peter Rowan, who was you know very famous in the bluegrass world, and, and I was starting to get some—not not a huge reg- reputation, but but um, but you underscored a, a good point, and in, in some ways. You're a very, in my opinion, you're a very modest person in a nice way. I think that's something important for for people to let somebody know that they would want to do that. Oh, I think that's really important. It's it's always amazing. You know, like when, like if I tell people that, hey, I want to do this, it's amazing what people say, hey, well, yeah, let's do that. But the Lyle gig, you know, I, I kind of, I, you know, kind of sat on it and I ended up having a, a really slow summer, like a really scary slow summer. And I and I called Ken up again. I said, "Hey, um, you know, if you hear of anything else that's going on." And before I could even finish the sentence, he says, "Hey," he said, "Oh yeah, Lyle might need a bass player." And so I I kind of interviewed with with uh, uh, Lyle. He actually and he does this typically. He wants to meet the people before he even hears a note, you know. And, and I guess I was okay to be around. And and about ten days before the tour. I found out that I got the gig. One of the other interesting things about about that situation is um, 
you know when you're when you're involved in something for so long it, it like everything it has its ebbs and flows and um one of the other bass players involved in his world is Leland Sklar, right? Have you gotten to spend a lot of time around him? Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. He's a sweetheart. I mean, I, uh, um, you know, he's one of my heroes. And uh, um, yeah, so there, there was a couple tours when we were having children that I didn't do everything, and Leland would come in and do those. And he had played on records prior to me being with him, and uh, yeah, just really we've gotten along great you know and and uh you know he did a he had a very you know very flattering thing he you know like he's he gets signatures from players that he likes and he had me sign one of his instruments and and uh you know so it's super cool yeah i mean basically between the two of them that's you know a good chunk of the james taylor classic lineup i got to record with james just recently it it, it was uh everything i i hoped it would be I love hearing that. That's great. Was it live with a band or? No, I was all overdubs. I ended up overdubbing on, a, on about 10 things. And uh, someone else that I really also wanted to work with was Steve Gadd. And he was on he was on the recordings. And, and uh, I've, we haven't been in the same room together yet. But uh, but no, it's a, it's a treat to be able to say that I at least have recorded with him in some way. Well, I mean, what was... I mean that couldn't have been so hard to play with. No, no, it was, <laughs> you know, but it was it was like one of those things, like, like when you've got somebody, you know, like such a um, a group of people, you know, especially like James Taylor and and uh, Steve Gadd. It's uh, you know when you've got that caliber, you know, like the answers are all there on what what to do. It's um, you know, and that's the way I felt with with Bill too. It's just like, well, you can't mess up, you know. Like it's, I mean, not in a way that it's, it's almost like, like it's so like, at least for me, it's like, it's so obvious on what to do and what not to do. Like, especially in the case of James Taylor, you know, and, and I don't know how many of the tunes are, are you know, because we recorded 10 things. I don't know if the, all the things will survive, but, um, you know, like his guitar is, is the most amazing thing. You just stay out of the way. You just help it. In which it doesn't need any help anyway, but you just kind of like, how do you just make it sound bigger, you know, or have low low notes on it, you know? <laughs> did he give you a lot of direction, or did he, he? He actually didn't give me that much direction. It was just kind of, let's, uh, you know, or, like if if we got hung up on anything, he would come in the room and just say, oh yeah, I th I think of it as this chord, and um, um, and that was really kind of the only thing. Or if you know, if he wanted to. I says, well, maybe play something here or maybe this octave here, or, you know, but it, re it really wasn't all that much. Wow, super cool. I can't wait to hear some of that when it's released. Um, you have two solo records that you've released, both which are absolutely amazing. And um, and I am was a huge fan of the first one before we even met. Um, and you've got such a distinctive writing style where you can hear a, a lot of things, a lot of influences you know or i hear them maybe because i know you but that music it's amazing how you strike um there's an elegance in your composing and in those in those records where um like you were saying kind of delaying the um being able to sit with something or let it kind of evolve but not pushing on it i think it draws more from film scoring than than anything even though there's moments of subtle improvisation um where where does your inspiration come from for your music well i mean i absolutely do love film scores i mean that's kind of what I, I i listened to film scores before i listened to pop music growing up and um um i don't know i i think i i love the the emotional content i mean and that's kind of the it's the the a film scores purpose is to bring out emotion that may not be apparent on the screen, or if you know, I mean, or it's a, it's a design to make you feel a certain way, and uh, so I always loved that, you know, or, or uh, you know, in, in the same way, instrumental music, it, it there isn't a narrative with it, I mean, or there could be a narrative, but you can interpret it. It's, it's not literal words that are telling you exactly how to feel or what's happening right at this moment. It's it's up for it, the individual's interpretation. And I think that's what I appreciate about instrumental music and especially, 
cue music or, or score music. Um, and then of course, you know, I love rock music and, and, um, and I grew up playing a lot of jazz. So I, I, um, you know, I, I appreciate the, uh, improvisational part of, of, of that or the, you know, or the, the genre of it. Um, you know, and then I, I love the conviction and in, you know, of, of, uh, of rock music. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm stuck in that era of, of, of the seventies and early eighties, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of, me too. Of that, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's kind of my era, you know, um, I don't know. So I, I, you know, I, um, I love all that stuff and, you know, and especially that first record, I, I, I kind of thought, uh, what, what possibly, um, got the record company excited to do it in the first place was the cast of players. It was Steve Jordan and uh, um, Bill Frizzell and uh, Jerry Douglas and uh, my sister, Allison. And um, Bill and Jerry had played together because we we had done some work together on the Nashville album. And and a lot of those those people, you know, I had, I had, I had experiences with touring or really getting inside of their music. You know, uh, you know, I'd played for years with Jerry, and um, uh, and his band, and then of course the work with with uh, um, with Bill. So I, I kind of knew what they would all bring. You know, so it was easy to kind of wrap my head around um, what this music would sound like. So and so in turn, so I wrote a lot of that music with those with those players in mind, you know, some of, some of them were older pieces, but uh, a lot of it was, was really written for those, you know, just knowing that, okay, well, they'll, I, I, I can kind of have them in mind and they'll deliver that. And on the first record, it's not as layered up as the second record where uh, predominantly the first records, is it all live or is there some, a little bit of stuff that you went back? A little bit like, overdubs, but not much. But it's pretty minimal. Yeah. So yeah, prim- that's primarily live. There were there were a few things that I overdubbed, and then um, my sister's component was there was uh, you know was layered vocals and strings, um, and so that was done um, as a pretty hefty overdub, couple days sessions uh, for that. But um, yeah, for the most part, the that record was live, and that actually that record's been a lot easier to to uh, replicate live. I can agree. I can testify to that. Yes, yes, you know that. Yeah. But the second yeah. record is 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 so unique. It's it's quite different than the first record in the sense that it is more layered and there's so um, not that there's so much going on, but it it's just a more expansive, thicker sound. Yeah, I, and and I, and I kind of deliberately wanted to do that. Most of that record is scored out. Um, where very little bit of it was improvised. Like all the parts and and um, uh, and that, that's why I thought uh, Dean Parks would be uh, such a important role in that one, you know, or component in that, just because he could be anything you wanted him to be, but still, still him, and um, but also can read like like he wrote it himself, and um, being kind of that one was a real tip to um, um, more so a, a tip to the love of of uh, score material. One fun fact, um, am I correct that Echo Tone, which is an absolute blowout to play the acoustic guitar part, you're actually playing some or all of that? I'm playing one of the acoustic guitar parts, like the, the opening riff is m- me, but then that, 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 that's all me. Um, uh, doubled on electric I think the joke you shared was that Dean Parks looked at it and, and you had maybe played it for him to kind of show him what it's supposed to be. And he's like, I think you should just play it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I think you got it. <laughs> but yeah, that was that was scary. That was a hard one to play. You know, just, just selfishly, I have to say that um, at one point, either you, I think Dean either forwarded it to me or you forwarded it to me, was his little kind of, crib notes um from the live gigs he had done with you and it was so amazing because i have so much respect i've never met him but he's someone who i admire so much and i'm inspired by and to see how he took this music that i had to learn 
and how he kind of encapsulated it and kind of broke it down into a way that he was using to do the gig, it was so sophisticated and so smartly laid out. It was really like a, it was kind of seeing behind the curtain a little bit. It was like, okay, I see why he's who he is. Yeah, he's he's like, I mean, he's like a superhero. I mean, like, I, I think he may be one of the, maybe the, I mean, smartest musicians I've ever met. And, um, and you know, he just, and, you know, just, just a total sweetheart too. You know, it's just like he'll, he'll do something crazy in the studio just from a sonic point, not, not, you know, even separate from everything that he can play, explain this huge amount of stuff that he's doing. And it just totally not, not uh, afraid to just explain the whole thing. There's no secrets of anything that he's doing. And, um, but you know, you, you, at least no one else can replicate it and, and do it exactly the way he does. Well, sure. I mean, isn't it true? I mean, think of all the people you've worked with. The mar- I always think a mark of, of real talent is somewhat... They, these people always tend to be quite empathetic. They tend to be very open and they tend to be very nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I think so, too. There's, there's a, it's not just... I think the people that, are, that rise to the top or at the top of their game, are are not there just because they can play. I think the question that at least I'm dying to know, what's up with the third record? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I did... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love to do another record. Um, you know, I, I, I did do a duets album um, that came out about a year and a half ago with this amazing harpist uh, uh, who I met at Berkeley, uh, Maeve Gilchrist. I love how it turned out, and uh, and that was that was primarily a live record with some, you know, some small overdubs. Victor, it's great to see you. It's great to catch up. I know, and, and I'd be remiss to say because it's such a funny anecdote. Is um, together I got to experience the fulfillment of a childhood prophecy of sitting in your living room <laughs> when we played Big Log. Oh God, a- wasn't that amazing? With your sister and Robert Plant watched us doing it. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that amazing? I remember we did that when they got left and they said, Oh, this turned out to be a pretty cool day, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it's only it's only one thirty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such an amazing thing. But um I've learned so much playing your music and spending time around you, so I appreciate getting to talk. Thank you for doing this. Oh, absolutely. Super cool. Yeah, and if you're lacking anything, call me back. Yeah, man, we got everything. It's awesome. Thank you for listening to the Loud Noise Podcast. I love to hear your feedback and want to make the show the best it can be. Please leave me a comment or tweet me at Steve Walsh Music on Twitter. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a couple minutes and leave me a review on iTunes. It helps get the word out about the show, plus I'd really appreciate it. You can subscribe to Loud Noise and you'll receive new episodes with new conversations full of tips, time savers, and advice to take your music to the next level. So dig in, get out there, and make great music. Until we meet again further on up the road, cheers. Cheers.